Good evening, Hope Reform Baptist Church. Open up to the book of Judges. We're in chapter 4 tonight, and this, is a, uh, uh, this one gets curly, and uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a sarcastic, bloody, gory, tremendous story. So turn there, Judges chapter 4. We're going to be in chapter 4 and 5, the story that feminists pretend to love, uh, beta males hate, and uh, the Bible uh, uh, points to us as an example of amazing adventure by God's sovereign grace and uh, power. So in Judges 4, we're going to find ourselves meeting a guy called Jabin, who is a Canaanite pagan king uh, in the land. He lives up on the north uh, of Israel. He's one of the guys that the Israelites should have killed, but failed to drive out. That's our context for the whole of the book of Judges, is that when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt through the desert up into the border of the promised land, and then Joseph, uh, sorry, Joshua, after him as military leader with Caleb, led the people across the Jordan River into the promised land. They were allocated for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were allocated land spots that their family was, uh, according to the promises of Abraham that God had made, and looking forwards to the promise of the Messiah who would come and be one of their kinsmen, They were going to uh, have allocated, allotted sections that each tribe would live in. And if they followed God's law, he would bless them and thrive them and make them to flourish in the land. But the first step before they could live in the land was that God commanded them to go in and by faith in his promises, uh, accordance to his law, and by trusting in the power of God's spirit to go before them, they had to make war with and either kill or drive out of the land all of the, uh, in, uh, the original inhabitants who were there before them. That was needed. That was part of God's mission. That was his commandment to them. Uh, make war, drive them out, obtain the promised land for yourself as God has laid before you. And as we saw in the first, uh, really, two chapters of, of the book of Judges, the introduction is they failed. A couple of the tribes made a good start, but eventually all of the rest of the tribes would fail to push the evil pagans out who are under the judgment of God. Remember, this wasn't just about Israel. Israel was also the guillotine of God's own justice against the pagans who had been eating and killing and burning their children, worshiping false gods, enslaving and raping. And so God wanted to judge them for their sins and wipe them off the earth. And Israel said, well, peace, love, tolerance, Jesus. Don't you realize uh, we'll ask them nicely to leave, but really we're a secular society and we don't want to be too heavy handed. And so for their tolerance, for their diversity, for their equity and for their inclusion, God started killing his own people. They didn't obey his laws. They didn't kill those they were meant to kill. Welcome to the Old Testament history. Real ugly, real true. Glory to God. Because they didn't do that, God then allowed, and we see this uh, happen in chapter 4 again, God didn't just permit, but it actually says that he would feed, strengthen, and rise up the enemies that they should have killed as a punishment. So sin has its own punishment baked into it. If you fail to obey God, that, that sin itself becomes a judgment onto you, a thorn in your side, and so it was for Israel. The very thing they failed to do became an enemy to them, and it wasn't just inconveniences. It wasn't just that the fuel prices went up and the taxes raised a little bit. It's that these foreign nations and foreign kings and foreign generals within their land uh, forbade right worship. They abused people. They took your women and impregnated them with their young men. They assaulted, murdered, and killed the military fighting men. They would put them as spectacles on the city walls, behead them, send them throughout the nation. This was real Old Testament, gory warfare as a punishment for their sins. And it's into this context that uh, that, uh, Judges chapter 4 begins. And we're basically going to, as we study this book, we believe what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 which is that every book of the Bible, every chapter of the book of the Bible will be instructive to us and help us see Jesus better for our salvation and will help us understand what we should be doing to be more righteous in our day and age. Now, there is some care given because we don't simply read something in Scripture and assume that's because it's reported that therefore it's recommended. That's not always the case. Some things are descriptive, not prescriptive. Judas went and hung himself. Don't go and do likewise. Uh, 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 This man enslaves Israel. That's not 
pro, we're not pro that any more than we're pro some of the sinful things that the, uh, the Israelites did. Uh, so it's recorded, not all of it is, is positive, and so we need to make some what we call hermeneutical applications, where we say, this is what we see in the story. Uh, the, the, the application is not a simple go and do likewise. Pick up a sword, find someone you hate, plant a flag, start a rebellion, eureka stockade, get, get back to the old spirit of Australia, start fighting the police. Not, not the application, at least tonight. No, our application usually has to go through some, through some hermeneutical process to ask, okay, that was faithful for them then, what needs to be faithful for us now? That was faithless and sinful for them then, what does that same kind of sin look like to us now? This is our, inst- uh, our uh, sort of aim, therefore. When we're looking through Judges, we're asking these questions. What happened? Because we want to understand the real true history without just spiritualizing and sort of uh, symbolizing and allegorizing the actual true history that took place in the Middle East on planet Earth that God wrote down because it would be good for us. So what actually happened? Then we're going to ask, how does this move forward and find its place in the whole redemptive history, the storyline of the Bible? Uh, Thirdly, how does this point us to Jesus as our Savior? Because all Scripture points us to Jesus somehow. And then fourthly, how can we take some application? Where where, where do we get stirred to obedience in light of this passage? So the first half of our sermon is just walking through the passage and noting and commenting so that we understand what is really happening. So I direct your eyes to the pages of Scripture before you, Judges chapter 4. And this is what God's Word said. The people of Israel, again... This is the cyclical nature of the book of Judges. They win, they're freed, they have peace, and then again they fail. They again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. That's the last judge that God raised up to save them. And they had 80 years of peace. This is approximately two generations. A, A whole generation of men and women have been able to be born in peacetime, get old, have children, estates, Ranches, great grandchildren, many Christmases. They didn't Christmas back then, but they celebrated birthdays. They got old. They died in their old age, still under peace. This was an amazing time of peace for Israel, especially in the days of the judges. But again, they turned and they did eat what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. A movement that only stays firm as long as a human leader is keeping it in shape is not, a, is not a true, lasting, spirit-deep movement. And this one proved the like. So verse 2, And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. That's, uh, he's the, Hazor is up in the north, uh, in the area of what should have been Naphtali's tribal land. Instead, there was a king they didn't kill, and he lived around Hazor. And so Jabin uh, became really, he took somehow sovereignty over uh, multiple, er- you know, the large portion of Canaan, and that engulfed most of Israel. And um, uh, so, so this is the first character that we meet. We see here, though, in verse 2, that the Lord is the one who is sovereign over every dot and tittle of this entire story. It's the Lord who sold his people into the hand of Jabin. The Lord intentionally said, they are my covenant people and I will get my Messiah out of them. I will get my glory out of them. I will not destroy the Israelites off the face of the earth. But this generation has turned despite my grace, my mercy, my blessings, my gift, my covenant, my laws and my presence. They have spurned me. They have not obeyed me. Therefore, I will sell them for pennies on the dollar to some other king. He can have them. I will, that God is omnipresent, but in the storyline we see as if God says, I'll leave Israel to the Israelites and the kings that want to own them. I'll go back over here and I'll wait to hear from them. I'll wait till they care enough to start praying again. And so it happens. The commander, uh, look at the, the, the rest of verse two. The commander of his army, that is Jabin's army, was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoyim. Verse 3, then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. For Sisera had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. That's a half of the sort of average lifespan back then. They were now under the oppression, the cruelty, and the tyranny of Jabin and Sisera really was the man who was bringing the iron claw down onto Israel's throats and necks. Uh, It says here that he had 900 
iron-plated chariots. That is the Old Testament equivalent of Humvees and tanks. These are the you know, mounted turrets we have in vehicles uh, these days. Back then, they would have uh, uh, archers on moving, fast-moving, horse-paced chariots, which were guarded by iron. These were not merely aluminium. This was not paper, cardboard, straw, and leaf. This was iron uh, 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 chariots that would protect. The, this is the equivalent of, of uh, Humvee-mounted turrets and tanks. And he had 900 of them. That's an enormous amount just to have horses. He had that many Iron chariots, we don't know how many horses there were to a chariot, but we're, we're being told this guy uh, had the greatest army in the Middle East. He had a, a, an impressive and oppressive army, and so it led the people of Israel, finally, after God had strengthened Sisera, now his people being at their weakest and their most desperate call out to him in prayer. And we see what happens then. Look at verse 4. Now, Deborah, a prophetess. All right. We're going to get to this a little bit later, but this is how you know it's real bad in Israel, right? When you walk into a place and they say, we're not doing well, our church is struggling to make budget, but, but Pastor Amy is going to take us through the next season. You know it should have closed down six months ago. Uh, when you get to Israel and they're so desperate and they're dying and they're being oppressed and then there's a prophetess, you go, Oh, it's bad. It's real bad. And we'll get to that why, why that is the case soon. But nonetheless, that is the, the spirit of the story. A prophetess. Now, she's a, she's a good gal. The sad thing is, she's the greatest. When, when every time we see these pieces of work, guys who are judges in Israel, uh, in this book, and we say, why would God use such a horrible person? At least part of our answer had to be, there wasn't any better. They were the best they had. <laughs> they were the person most righteous, most leaning, most hearing from God. That's the one he used. That, that's got to say something. Uh, when he's deceptive, when Samson is adulterous, when he is unrighteous, for example, when, when the judges are bad, don't think, well, why would God use... I mean, the pickings were slim. That's why they were in such a horrible state to begin with. And that horrible state included that the one person able to hear from the Lord was Deborah, a prophetess. She was the wife of Lapidoth, which is a, a wuss name. Don't you just reckon? Lapidoth. And he's not mentioned again. So her husband is, um, he's a stay-at-home dad, and he doesn't believe in uh, uh, working necessarily, and uh, he's really sticking it to the man by wearing sandals and listening to his uh, vinyls at home. So Deborah is the leader of that household and apparently the leader of the nation, while Lapidoth does his Lapidoth stuff. And she was judging Israel at that time. She used to, now here's, here's part, of the, uh, part of the scenery. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. So there is a little bit of a difference between her and some of the other judges, and especially the prophets that would come in Israel's history, is that usually the male prophets would take God's scrolls, the word of God, they would go into town center, they would set up usually somewhere, and say, hear my authoritative preaching. I have authority, I have authority, let's stick with that, very Texan. I have authority to declare to you the word of God, repent, you're doing this wrong. Uh, answer to the Lord for your sins. Deborah, uh, in the right biblical model as a woman, was actually not going in with power and authority that is right, Scripture shows us, for a preaching male. Rather, she's, she's a hill gal. She's a horse girl. She's got her country boots on. She's got a sundress on and a straw hat. And she would love to just be sort of minding her animals, but the Lord has chosen her to speak. And so she sits under the tree. I think she's got a straw sticking out of her, sticking out of her mouth and a banjo that she likes to strum in between uh, uh, visitations. But the Israelites who want to hear, they come to her. So they come to her for advice from what the Lord has said. It's not as if she goes out as authoritative prophet and teacher over the whole nation. And that, I think, is, well, that is included for us to know this is a different kind of prophetess to, to Moses, who was a prophet, and others who would come later. Nonetheless, look at what uh, verse 6 says. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali. So he's up in the north. 
<laughs> he's actually quite close, uh, strategically placed uh, to, uh, 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 between the rest of Israel and Hazor, where Jabin and Sisera are placed. So uh, she sent off and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali to come to her and said to him, has not the Lord... So we sort of get this idea already. God has spoken to him. He ignored it. Now God's going to speak through a woman to rebuke him for not listening to the Lord. She says, has not the Lord already told you? There's already a rebuke baked into the first words of Deborah in this passage is, why do I keep on having to tell the men what to do? Why do I have to tell the pastors how to pastor? Why do I, a prophetess, have to tell the men how to read the Bible that tells them how to be men of God? It's the men who were meant to lead their families, not Deborah, lead her, Labi Sukidoth, and the rest of the nation. I don't know. I'll probably see Lappy in heaven and have to apologize. Maybe he was a top guy. I don't know. But it fits my way of telling the story. Already, she says, you didn't listen, Barak. The only reason I have a job is because you won't listen. So hear it from me now. And she says, has the Lord not told you? Has the Lord, the God of Israel, not commanded you, go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and from the people of Zebulun? Now, you, can, you can see why now, Barak is, is largely, he has some shining moments uh, under the leadership of Debbie, but he is ultimately a coward in this story. He is not as strong as he should be. He does not step forward when he should be. And that's, that's emblematic and symbolic of the whole spiritual state of Israel. The men are not leading. Barak, the, apparently the most able-bodied or, or the most likely, or for whatever God's reason of choosing him, the chosen one to lead a military rebellion against a king who has Humvees and tanks. God chooses him, and he still has to hear secondarily from a woman and but we can understand his, his hesitancy at least. You, you, if you gather a, a huge army, if you march on you know, Washington DC or Canberra or the capital city in, in, in the palace in China with all of your rebels flying enemy flags or rebels flags, you're inviting execution. It's tyranny. It's treason. And so he knows what that is. If, if he does what God has told him to do, here's his logic. If he does what God told him to do and God doesn't come through, he's dead. That's, you don't sympathize with that. Maybe we do. We lean on it. Yeah, that's really, I understand his, his passivity. That, that's a blasphemous way to think. He's going, if I, re, if I go up with 10,000 men and God doesn't come through, I'll die. You have to understand that I'm, I'm weighing these things in the balance. God's faithlessness and failure is never a factor in our calculations. Never. We make plans as a church, as families, as Christians. We pray and make plans entirely and wholly banking on the promises of God. That's it. They never fail. That is part of the point of the book of Judges. Humans, Israelites, we fail. We break covenant. We are unreliable and untrustworthy, and God never fails. Every human leader, family member, friend, spouse you have will fail you, sin against you, or offend you in sinful ways. God has never done you wrong. God can never do you wrong. So Barak was uh, unrighteously uh, cowardly. So look at verse 7. Um, <coughs> God continue, uh, Deborah continues to quote God to Barak and says, And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him over into your hand. You go gather the army, I will draw out Sisera, and I promise you, you will win, says the Lord God of hosts. Here is his uh, uh, Braveheart-inspired uh, biblical masculinity. He was reading some, you know, Doug Wilson and Mark Driscoll over the weekend. He put the books down, he marched over to Deborah, and he said, when called to military uh, battle, he said, I'll go if you go, Deb. That's his response. Look at what he says. Barak said to her, verse 8, I, we can't believe that cowards would rise to leadership or to influence in society, would we? This is unheard of. Uh, organizational leadership, denominational leadership, church leadership, spiritual leadership, blog leadership, 
Maybe in your workplace, you've never seen this. The cowards who just say yes to everybody and who have no real spite. They never get into leadership, I know. But stretch your imagination if you can. It is at least a little bit funny that his name is Barack. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, uh, anyway, uh, if you go with me, he says, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. What a cowardly response. Women, some women, some wives know what it is like to live and have to try and submit to and respect an indecisive, cowardly husband. I don't know. How do you want to educate the kids? Uh, do you want kids? I don't know. If you want kids, we're going to have kids, I guess. I don't know. How much do you think we need to make? Do you think we need a holiday? I don't know. What do you want to have for dinner? No, what do you? I don't know. What do we want to have for dinner? Uh, uh, I don't know. What church do you want to go to? Do you like this church? Do you like that church? I don't know. I'm looking for a church anyway. Uh, I kind of delegated that to you, baby. Um, uh, you can only imagine the frustration of Deborah. God told you once, he disobeyed. I'm telling you now, he's going to give the army into your hand. You get the hit. You're going to have a statue, Barak. You're going to get a plaque. You're going to get stories. You're going to be in the Bible. Glory. And he says, I'll only go if you promise to come with me. I need a support friend. I need a, uh, uh, this is like the teenage uh, high school girl who needs a friend to walk up to the teacher and ask something, you know, and they're holding hands under, you know, behind their collots, and she's really strong, and she's going over her affirmations on the way up. That's Barack. I will go if Debbie is allowed to come with me. And she said, I will surely come with, yes! says Barack. He's skipping his heels. He probably skips. He's that kind of guy. He's journaling that night. <laughs> Debbie said yes today, and I'm so glad tomorrow we get to... <coughs> Deborah had every single right to hide at home and not ride to the front lines. That's literally a woman's privilege in wartime. You don't have to fight the guys with swords. It's a mark of twisted paganism that puts women on the front lines, puts weapon in their hands. Uh, it's sort of girl boss, women can do everything men can do to put them on the front lines. It's a shame and it is a curse and it is a sign of rebellion and societal degradation when we affirm societally women on the front lines, when we confirm and even legalize and then normalize and then defend the fact that we have women protecting men. That's a shame on any society. Deborah had the full hope, I'll deliver the message because I'm just a preacher because no other guys are preaching. I'll just tell him the message and he says, well, you have to come to the front lines as well and inspire the men and keep them motivated and give a good speech. That'll be your job. And she, though she had all right as a woman to say, shame on you, I will not go. Rather, with more guts than he seemed to have, where she was saying, you need to go defend the women and children, and he said, only if one of them come with me. Deborah submitted to the will of the Lord, and she said, uh, uh, and she said here in verse uh, 9, she said, I will surely go with you. Now, notice, they're not married. This isn't his, her husband that she's saying, darling, I will support you. I'll come with you. You said so. I'll come with you. I'll support you. from. I'll be your, I'll be your cheerleader. Right? I'll, I'll support you. I'll give you a kiss. They're just like BFFs. He's just got this gal friend who he wants to really instill courage into him because he doesn't know if he'll be able to uh, obey the Lord if she's not with him for moral support. This is supposed to look shameful. So they pinky promised, he made her pinky promise, and she says, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, this is not without consequence. God's sovereign purposes often work over and above men's cowardice, but it never has no consequences for those men. And so God says uh, through Deborah here, I'll go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For Yahweh will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. God said this beforehand so that when it happened, it didn't just look like an accidental uh, mishap and military coincidence. God told them beforehand so that they could see God's sovereign hand working through the situation so that every man involved, especially Barak, would feel the burn of the rebuke. 
maybe at this point of reading, and if you're not familiar with Judges, don't skip ahead. Uh, it, it's, it's an amazing story if you don't know the story. So I would, I would love the pleasure and the privilege of telling you the story for the first time. So please don't read ahead. Uh, but you probably at this point might think, oh, God's going to let Deborah, kind of like Eowyn uh, in the Lord of the Rings, uh, ride in, maybe in male armor, and ride in and kill the Nazgul, you know, king of, uh, the dark king of Endor or whatever his name. Deborah is going to be the woman who wins. There's going to be another character introduced, and she is a favorite. Uh, she is a, she's a gem. She's just a sweet, sweet gal. But we're going to get there soon. Nevertheless, this is the prophecy. God's going to let a woman win today. She's going to get the plaque. She's going to get the song. She's going to get the statue, and Barak will be a name of shame and cowardice. <clears throat> So the next uh, portion uh, here tells us that the next day, uh, you know, uh, uh, in ver- uh, end of verse 9, they then actually did what the Lord had commanded him to do. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak. Do you see how she even has the, the frontwardness in the sentence? She's the initiator now. She arose and went with Barak. It doesn't say Barak arose and took Deborah, but she arose and went with Barak to Kadesh, to the area that God had commanded. And Barak called out Zebulun. He's starting to get some courage. He does what God commanded him. He's holding Deborah's hand behind the curtain, and he delivers an exhilarating speech to the crowds. And he calls out uh, Zebulun, one of the northern tribes. And uh, it says here, he called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up at his heels. And Deborah went with him. <laughs> you can just see him. And if it was, this is Hollywood, you'd have the narrow shot. And he's marching up the hill and he's got his helmet on and he jumps onto the horse and he's riding off into the sunset. And as the, the, it pans out and shows the, the wide shot, there's 10,000 men ready for battle. And as it sw- swipes over just to the side, you can see Deborah holding, his, holding him on his horse. You know, sort of just making sure he doesn't fall off. That's the kind of scene we have there in that sentence. And he mustered 10,000 men. And Debbie went with him. <clears throat> Look at verse 11. Now, Heba, the Kenite. Heba, the Kenite. Now we're introduced to another family. He had separated from the Kenites, who was the descendants of Hoab, the father-in-law of Moses, uh, and he had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Zaananim, which is near Kadesh. That makes zero sense for us, does it? Uh, basically, uh, Moses' father-in-law uh, had come with the Israelites. His people, the descendants, had come with the Israelites into the land. And Heba, for whatever reason, it seems like a treacherous region. Reason. Because he moves north, further into the land owned and occupied by the king uh, 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 of our story tonight, whose name is escaping me, uh, uh, King Jabin in Hazor, the place where he removed himself from the Israelites and moved up to north was closer to that king. It says later in the story that he had a peace treaty and covenant with that king. Seems like maybe for whatever reason, he had compromised, he had broken covenant with Israel and with God and had made peace and had sided with uh, the Canaanites over the Israelites. So, Again, Heba, the treasoner. Heba, the coward. Heba, the compromiser. He was living up there near Kadesh, verse 12. He, now, that's just sitting out on its own. We have no, it's without context. Trust me. Heba and his wife will come up in the story later on. Now, verse 12. When Sisera, the general of the Canaanites, was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots. Now, here's the theological question. Did Sisera call his chariots or did God call out his chariots? Sisera, good. Uh, This is the dualism. Here's Sisera thinking, I'm calling out the, the chariots, but he himself is a player in the story that God is already writing. God has called him to call out his chariots and he doesn't realize that he's calling them to their death. He calls them out, uh, 900 chariots of iron. The Humvees start, the Chinook choppers start tearing across the open air, the, the, the tanks start tearing out through, the, uh, uh, through the, the, the towns and make their way towards the battlefield, basically. Uh, and Deborah, uh, sorry, uh, verse 13. Sisera called out his 900 chariots of iron and all the men who were with him from Harosheth at Hagoyim to, up to the river in Kishon. So there's this big battlefield, sort of a triangular space with mountains, Mount Tabor next to it, and along one of the sides is a large river, River Kishon. Um, Verse 
uh, verse 14. And Deborah said to Barak, this is an inspiring scene right here. And Deborah said to Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. That would be such a cool scene if a woman wasn't his hype man. It's like, it's like, it would be like trying to imagine the scenes of Braveheart, but it's a woman playing William Wallace. And maybe that Netflix movie's coming. I don't know. But they've, it's so, it could have been so inspiring. But she, he had, he let her do the speeches and the calls and the mustering and the motivation. She was riding along the horses, uh, hitting all of their shields and all of their swords and calling them to battle. It is so unmotivating. It's a shame that they were motivated by this. It was a shame that Barak made Deborah do the preaching and the stirring and the mustering of the men. Nonetheless, she speaks truly. The Lord has given Sisera into your hands. This is a, uh, a, 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 the, all of the glory. This is one of the dynamics of this whole story. Everything that's glorious shouldn't have even happened if people were doing their jobs right. Everything that happened, they wouldn't have needed judges if they were following the Lord. The fact there's a judge to save them is a judgment on them. Deborah does amazing things, but for all of her glory, it's a shame that she had to. There should have been a man in the place. She gives this amazing speech. She shouldn't have had to. She's, it, it, it should have been Barak, and, and instead they've got this sort of, I picture her as you, you ever play, play uh, school sports or club sports and there was that one kid who wasn't all that good, but his mum believed in him. <laughs> and so Deborah's like on the sideline and she's, she's kind of Bayrak's mum who just believes he's, he's the best. You know, you know, she's clapping, she's cheering. She, every time he falls over, she says, oh, get, you, go, you, you can do it, Bayrak. Get back up. She, she brought the orange peels. At halftime, she's running around to the whole team and taking photos, and, and she's making sure uh, Bayrak has all of his, uh, his padding on and his, uh, his, his owies are all, are all band-aided up. That's the scene here. Amazing speech that she shouldn't have given. She shouldn't have been there to have to give it. Nonetheless, we move on in the story. Uh, so Bayrak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. Even that sentence does not say like with Shamgar or Ehud or Othniel. It does not say that they rose up and slaughtered the men. It says God did it and he used Barak. He did it by the hand of Barak. Barak is so passive in his personality and his nature, so he's given a passive uh, following position and character in the story. And uh, we, we ask the question, how is it? How is it that they, this is a gutsy, gutsy, gutsy tactic. They have 900 chariots and tens of thousands of soldiers running towards them. And their tactic is kind of do the Highlander march, the Highlander rush, where they just hold their swords and just sprint at a wall of iron sheeting with arrows and spears behind it that is moving towards them at 60 kilometers an hour to crush them. That's their tactic. I have, uh, I'm not a professional or an expert in uh, military tactics. I'm pretty sure foot soldiers running at a tank is not up there on the most effective lists. I have no idea how much courage, and this is one of the good parts of the story, I don't know how they mustered so much courage. I have never had a gun. No, we have. Nepal, we had, we had soldiers, didn't we? We had uh, soldiers pointing guns at us, but they were small Nepalese men. They were not all that threatening, and they weren't behind a tank. I, I have played paintball for a Bucks party and once just rushed a hill and Thought the Lord was on my side, and I fell, and I was just destroyed by... And, you know, you put your hand up when you're playing a paintball to say, I've been hit, let me go back in peace. But when you're on a Bucks party, all bets are off. And I just got basically buried by, uh, by, by paintballs and came back bleeding everywhere, under the neck, under the arm. Uh, but I will say, obviously, you know, we've got men who are maybe coppers or uh, uh, in the military or have been in the past in our church... I'm not claiming any equality on that level. What I'm saying is, that is a gutsy move. 
The Lord had filled them with faith by the exhilarating speech of Deborah. And they were running at a wall of iron. How did they beat them? How did 900 chariots coming at them at horse speed get beaten? And our clue is given to us in chapter 5, verse 4. Look at the next chapter. The next chapter is a song that is sung about the battle. And it says this, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched down from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. There's this clue given to us that these chariots with heavy wooden and steel wheels coming over the field towards the Israelites, the rain clouds gather in, a, in an almost miraculous speedy gathering by the Lord's anointing, appointing, and the, water, the, the ground becomes muddy, their wheels become clogged, and the river Kishon begins to overflow and wash away the chariots. We also see in verse 21 uh, of chapter 5 in the song, we see... The torrent Kishon swept them away, and the ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. March on, pray on, we're gaining ground. Sorry, that's not what it says. March on, my soul, with might. This is a military song. So we get the clue here. How God beat the, the, the chariots is that the water clogged and the mud clogged their wheels. They couldn't move. They had to get out, and they were overrun by the soldiers of the Lord, the Israelites filled with faith. Now, here is what then happens after, uh, after that. Look at verse, uh, the end of verse 15. And Sisera, sorry, verse 15. The Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. So he gets to the mountains, makes his way through the valley, finds the road, makes his way to a nearby village and town. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harosh Hagoyim. So back to their base is where Barak chases them, now filled with faith and courage. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Here's the trick, though. They haven't found Sisera. They're toppling over the dead bodies. They're looking for the armor bearers. They're finding the flags. All of the army is dead. They have chased them and destroyed them, but they can't find Sisera. They're looking for Sisera. Where's the general? Where's the one who would muster and raise up another army if he can, if we leave him alive? Where is Sisera? We see that Sisera had run by foot. And in verse 17, we find out where he goes. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heba the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heba, the Kenite. That man that was mentioned without context a few paragraphs ago, he is forgotten. He is known to us only as the sinful, uh, 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 idolatrous, compromising uh, oath breaker, Heba. But his wife, Jael, she's at home. Where's, 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 uh, where's uh, Heba? He may well have died on the field. We don't know. Uh, he's not helping Israel, we know that because he has a treaty with the king, but he's not at home defending his wife when a battle is a few kilometers away. He's somewhere, maybe he's at the pub with the boys, he's doing lawn, lawn bowls, he's at the gaming salon, whatever he's doing, he's not at home, he's not protecting his wife and he's not fighting, he has made a horrendous uh, co uh, covenant with a Canaanite king and we see as a good submissive Proverbs 31 wife, she... She, she rebels against her husband's horrible, idolatrous leadership like every woman should. This is an act of submission to God and an act of submission and respect to her husband. She does not honor an idolatrous, damnable, condemning covenant that he had made. This would be very similar if in the 1960s and 70s in China, under Mao's cultural revolution, a Christian man had um, taken down the Christian verses from their home windows and had taken down uh, the Christ-honoring signs and put up a communist party, uh, Mao's revolution flag, and said to the wife, we just got to wait this out. I've promised from my shop I will sell Mao's little red book. We need to play the wave, play it smart, play it peaceful. I've promised to... Uh, uh, they, they've given me a government job. I'm going to look after us with our funds. I'm a minister of propaganda. My darling, be a good wife. Say nothing. When he goes off to work, she gathers up all of the little red books, takes it into town, and starts a bonfire. 
She would no doubt die. She would die under the smile of the Lord. Submission to such cowardice would be sin against God. JL does not respect what her husband has told her to do, though no doubt, I hope, she respected her husband and the office of husband, but she did not submit to his idolatrous, sinful behavior. And so here is what happened. Verse 18, and JL, now in my mind, and in all the paintings, JL is pretty. By any standard, she's pretty. Because when she runs out, a fleshly, carnal, murderous king sees her, and loses all sense of logic. Now it's true, he had a peace with the king, sure. Everything about this is still off. Pretty woman comes out and says, come into my house, my husband's not home. Any man that says, sure, thinks she's hot. That's, that's the rule, that's the law. So she's pretty, she comes out and she says in verse 18, she came out to meet Sisera and said to him, with a flick of the hair, I think she took off her veil, threw her apron over her shoulder, put the bread pin, rolling pin down. She goes, twirls her hair. Come aside, my Lord. Turn aside. Come on in. Uh, Turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. With a little wink, with a nice smile. So, lo and behold, he turned aside to her and into the tent. And she covered him with a rug. This all sounds very nice. She's honoring her husband's peace treaty with the king, and she's hiding under the floorboards. She's hiding the Sisera, uh, Sisera the, the, the Canaanite general, the war crime, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, Lenin of uh, their day. He's gonna hide, she's going to hide him and keep him nice and safe. And, and he said to her, look at verse 19, and he said to her, please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So, thinking a little bit deep, she's very hospitable. He asks for water. What does she give him? Nice, maybe freshly drained from the animal, milk. Nice milk. Uh, uh, one of the verses of the song later says that he got a cur- uh, she got him curds, which is like a, a sour yogurt, like Greek yogurt. So she serves up the sweet little dessert, side of milk. He has it. And what happens? So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the opening of the tent And if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here, say no. All right? So JL goes, all right, Sisera, you want me to lie so that we can win the war. You want me to lie so the good guys win the battle? That's exactly what I want. I promise I will do exactly that. (laughs) But you're the bad guy, and I'm going to kill you. So the next verse says, it's just so sweet the way it just rolls off the tongue. She opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink. He made his request. Verse 21, but Jael, the wife of Heba, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. And then she went, I love this, softly. (laughs) She didn't want to wake him. She cared about his sleep. Uh, She went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple. And the sense of this is that it doesn't go through in one hit, which would be a very difficult blow. It goes into his temple and uh, until, she was driving it into the temple, until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. This next half a sentence is hilarious. So he died. (laughs) Thank you, author of the book of Judges. We... We needed that clarification. His head is in pieces with a tent peg poking out of the side of it, and he is dead, just for the, those who didn't go to medical school. If you're not a biologist, this is a dead man on the ground. And behold, as Barak was pursu- he's just too late. He's 30 seconds too late from being able to kill a sleeping general and claim the statue, just as God had prophesied. Just then, he runs into town, following the tracks maybe. Maybe there's a a trail of blood. Maybe the armor had been thrown off by Sisera as he ran it. And Barak had had, 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 uh, uh, attracted him and he found the small town. He sees a tent and he comes forward. And uh, 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 Jael went out to meet Barak and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you are seeking. Right, I wonder, you know, she quickly got rid of the blood off her, quickly spruced up a bit, tied her hair back, wiped her hands off. Uh, I don't know what her ploy or her play was, whether she was still playing the, oops, you know, 
come and see. I, there's a man. Something happened. Uh, and then he comes in. Uh, come and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. Didn't even remove it. It stuck into the ground. The last three hits were probably unnecessary, but she wanted to drive the skull there and keep him there and probably not let Bayrak pick it up and claim some kind of a victory. She pinned it to her rug in her house, marking her win. And he saw it, and he was probably exhilarated, a little jealous, but happy that it was over. I wonder if she was, you know, played the, I'm such a klutz, you know, who knows how these things happen. <laughs> uh, you know, but nonetheless... On that day, verse 22, 23 says, On that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. Who did it? God did it. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. This is the story. God has brought up his people in courage and they def she defeats the general and wins the war that motivates the Israelites to then keep on pushing forward and ultimately topple the kingdom. There is, uh, in chapter 5, verse 24, there's this verse that is, uh, verse 24 to 27, there's a verse devoted to Jael. Barak gets one mention in the song and he's just mentioned at the beginning. I wonder, it says in verse chapter 5, then sang Deborah and Barak, so he's already behind her in order, the son of Abinoam, on that day. So they wrote the song together. Like she wrote it and she sort of passed, passed it over him for a once over. This is the song we're going to sing with everybody's when marching back home. Sort of flicks over it and goes, Yeah, that's, yeah, I, I sort of thought maybe I'd get a mention somewhere. He, I found the dead guy. Does that get. No, all right, there I am. So he's like in one of the first leading, uh, uh, one of the first uh, stanzas where it says, you know, Bayrak went forth. That's all he gets. <laughs> he was with them. Uh, whereas mostly the song is about the mother of Sisera. So even she gets a mention. The mother of Sisera, the woman Deborah, and the woman Jael. Look at verse 24 to on, onwards. This is where Jael is praised. This is just a great piece of uh, uh, history where the song comes in. Some of the earlier, many evangelicals would do good to take this to heart. Most of the earliest songs of praise and worship in the Bible were militaristic praise songs for dead enemies. Right? Make evangelical worship music militant again. That's what we want. The, and so they, they write, they sing, and then they're marching. So it was a marching song. It was a bit of a shanty as they were, you know, rowing back home or as they were marching back home. Uh, the men were singing this war song about the victory that God brought through the women. It's very ironic. Nonetheless, in verse 24, this is one of the songs about Jael. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heba the Kenite. Of the tent dwelling women, she is the most, I don't know that that's a high bar, but of all the ladies who live in tents, she's the best. Uh, he asked for water, she gave him milk. She bought him curds in a noble's bowl. So a nice bowl. She even had the nice bowl for him. She, went, uh, she sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. Glory, hallelujah. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. It is truly, truly hilarious to me that people look at this passage and they try and utilize it for an Old Testament uh, uh, example that God uh, permits and promotes female leadership in the church and in the spiritual community. So, you know, there's complementarians, that's us, who believe that God has ordained that in the church, in the family, and in society, in, in, uh, uh, in um, uh, 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 the civil magistrate, it is men that God has geared, designed, and called to lead. And all throughout the scripture we see, that doesn't mean women can't do amazing things and great things in business and work and productivity, but one of the highest callings of women is, is motherhood and rearing souls that will be soldiers for Christ. And they sort of see that as very sexist. It's demeaning of women. And we say, we'll find an example in the Bible when God raised up a female prophet like the other men or a female queen who wasn't the evil queen mother in the Old Testament or maybe a female apostle or a female priest, anything like that. And, and scouring the bottom of the bucket and scraping, they lift one of the flaps of mold and underneath it they find Judges 4. See, Deborah a prophetess 
JL the military victor, God affirms just as much as male leadership, female leadership. You're supposed to laugh very hysterically right there. Not only because, as we've seen, the whole tenor of the story is that it's a shame these women have to do this. It's literally the judgment of, the, of God on the men that the women have to be the saviors in this way. But also, as we've seen, Deborah was not some uh, leader, a uh, prophet over the people in an authoritative sense, nor was she a queen or, or some kind of uh, a royal ruler. In fact, Isaiah says in chapter 3, verse 12, my, in, in, sort of, decrying how much of a horrible, iniquitous state the nation has gotten to, Isaiah says, speaking for God, my people, infants are their oppressors and women rule over them. Women are in political office and infant kings are coming and knocking down their walls. So it's actually a sign of judgment and a terrible symptom when men are not found, when men are cowards, when men do not step up and they make, they push, they then allow, they permit, then they, they justify women to take the spiritual leadership where men have been called to. We said before, if the leaders were meant to be the best among them, then this means Deborah is the best among them, and that's a judgment. The feminist, what they should look for is a verse, maybe in verse 32 of chapter 5, a verse 32 which says, and then in their righteousness and revival, they made Deborah queen or leader or prophet and God blessed them. But it doesn't say that. It says at the lowest point of their history, they had a female leading and speaking for God. That should say something. So no, it does not actually affirm female equal leadership in the Bible. Neither is it a proof for female girl boss theology, which is basically the theology that says God made us equal, and that's true, and therefore anything a man can do, a woman can do. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, that's not scriptural. Men can't do everything women can do, and women cannot do anything a man can do. But a lot of evangelical uh, leaders will try and tout this as the big, it's okay, I'm for women, I'm pro-woman. Often they're also pro-choice. They go, women can do anything a man can do. Uh, uh, but, but let's look, if, and I've heard people use JL as an example. See, Barak can lead 10,000 men, she can kill a general. Same thing. Right, the facts of the case are not stacked up in that way. Look at the tools of her warfare. The tools of her warfare in this story are a well-kept home. Oh, not sounding good for feminists, is it? A well-kept home, a welcoming front door, a kind word of hospitality, a jug of milk, clean dishes. Nice. She had entertaining wear. She went and got the noble bowl and brought it out to serve him the curds in. She also knew the recipes, and she, had, she knew how to cook because she knew how to make curds. You don't buy that in the can in Israelite IGA. Uh, so she knew how to cook. She had clean dishes. She had entertaining wear. She had a made-ready bed that a general didn't mind lying down on, on the ground, or a bed on the ground. So she had a well-kept house, swept clean. And the tools that she used were housekeeping tools. She lived in a tent. She, to put up the tent, literally a homemaking tool. When your tent is your, when your home is a tent, tent peg and hammer is homemaking tools. That's like a woman uh, killing a man, uh, killing an assailant with like a broom and a and a beat mixer. This, this is woman. This is these are very female tools. But she was also strong enough, useful enough, productive enough to be able to swing that thing through a, a man's head. So, but still, you line all of these up. This does not make a tremendous feminist case, does it, <laughs> for girl boss theology. She's not a career woman. She's not doing anything a man can do. She's doing a tremendous thing in her sphere that God has given her to do. And this shows us that against the idiocy of the feministic mindset, sometimes God topples kingdoms using homemakers in the midst of domestic duties. That's what feminists don't want you to believe. If you're at home, if you're looking after a family, if you keep your house, you're the loser of failure and I want more for you. Maybe you read Judges and go, I don't know, maybe I get to kill an enemy king one day. So, in this song, the men are hardly mentioned. Uh, uh, God, uh, uh, we've saw, we saw he honors Jael. We also see that he honors Deborah. She's called, uh, in verse 7, a, she arose as a mother in Israel when the rest of the men and the army did not exist. Uh, but it also does mention, look at verse 28. It mentions in what is probably an MA poem, section of the poem, it mocks 
the mother whose son died. It makes fun of a lady, an old lady at home waiting for her son to return from war. And it's a song of praise and worship to God that we're supposed to amen. Do you see what I mean when I say, we as evangelicals read the book of Judges and it automatically starts hardening us because we didn't think this was ever allowed to be said. You know what it says? It's speaking about the mother of Sisera. Out of the window she peered. It's making fun of an old lady looking out the curtain waiting for her son to come home. Out of the window she peered, the mother of Sisera. Do you see how it, it kind of puts the blame on the son for the kind of mothering he kind of got? What kind of woman doesn't disown their son when he is a, tyran a tyrannical, murderous, raping general? She should not be waiting for her son. She should not consider him a son. But she does. She loves that her son's militaristic campaign and, and, and uh, career has made her rich. She loves the pearl necklaces. She loves her retirement uh, villa that he's got her. She loves her life. She doesn't care about the Israelites or God. She's just as sinful as Sisera. Out of the window she peered. The mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? And then her wisest of princesses answer her. So she's rich off this filthy, she's like a mob boss's mum, right? She's this anxious, you know, mum waiting for her son to come home from one of his street shootings. Oh, where's the V8 Cadillac coming in? Oh, I'm worried about him. And one of her princesses, so one of his wives, comes over to her and says, and this is their comfort to her. Indeed, she answers herself. So they say it and she says, that's so true. Why am I worrying? Here's their comfort to her. Have they not found and are divided the spoil? They've killed lots of Jews. They're stealing their belongings and they're dividing it up. Here's the worst part. A womb or two for every man. Oh, mother of Sisera, raping takes a while, especially when there's so many women that have been captured that each man gets to rape two women. It takes some time. Give him a moment. You'll get your pearls. You'll get another dress. You'll have another nice shawl. I'm sure he'll bring you home some dishes. A womb or two for every man, spoiled of dyed materials for Sisera, spoiled of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as a spoil. You'll get your embroidered dresses, mother of Sisera. It's okay. He's just raping women first. And she comforts herself with this. And so the song includes her as an old wench that deserves to be mocked because her son's dead. And here's, here's the... Here's the, I'll try and be PG-rated, humor. He is in another lady's bedroom, isn't he? He got hammered, didn't he? But not how she prayed to her false gods that it would happen. This is kind of a, a poetic divine irony that reminds people to stop playing games with God. To Israel and to Canaan, God will not be messed with. So verse 31 closes out. So... This is the sweet, beautiful, you know, banjo song that she sings as she sits, uh, Deborah sits underneath the tree, singing to her horses. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And as this, the credits sort of come up, and the, and the land had rest for 40 years. This song also mocks pacifists and theoreticians. Look at verse uh, 14 and 15. Basically, it's saying all the men who, in their courage and in their patriotism and in their covenant-keeping faithfulness to God, took up their arms, found their shotguns from underneath the barn, and marched in a great muster up the mountain, singing their songs of praise to God, ready for war. Because, you know, they marched down the commanders. From Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant staff. Verse 15. The princes of Ishakar came with Deborah, and Ishakar faithful to Barak. Into the valley they rushed at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. They really prayed about what God wanted them to do. 
See, they had deep convictions and theological traditions, and they had committees and councils, and it's just not always wise or smart to rush in and make a quick decision. So they sat back, they called a council, and in about a month or so, they were going to come to a decision. Let us search out, are our motives even right? Are you going to make an idol, maybe, uh, sons of Reuben, are you going to make an idol out of winning? Right? They, they, they wrote for the, the coalition blog, right? That's, that's these guys. In, in the council, in the tribes of Reuben, they had great searchings of heart. They were very introspective men. They prayed all about it. Should we go and fight the enemy to save our brothers, our women and children? Well, the holy thing is to pray. 16, why did you sit still among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? Oh, you were busy, were you? You needed to look after your sheep which we're all going to die very soon if Sisera wins. Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, right? They didn't come help. And Dan, why did he stay with his ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landings. Zebulun is a people who risk their lives to the death. Naphtali too, on the heights of the field. The kings came, they fought, then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh. By the waters of Megiddo, they got no spoils of silver. From heaven, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. It mocks the men who were too holy to do anything. This is like there's a great man. I've told you throughout this series, I'll use some other historical examples of this, uh, Christian examples. There's a man uh, a couple of decades ago, Sam Childers. He became known, he's the good guy, he became known as the machine gun preacher. Not because he preached with a rat-a-tat-tat stutter or because he was a great preacher. He was the machine gun preacher because he used a machine gun and killed men. It's great. So he had uh, this, uh, he was ex-military and he formed a militia and he worked alongside the Sudanese People's Liberation Army to save and free children who were kidnapped by the the rebels' uh, army. And those children were forced to become child soldiers. He used his military American training and started armed missions to free the children at his own cost. This earned him the name Machine Gun Preacher because he used firearms in these operations. He also founded the Angels of East Africa, which started and ran orphanages for children who were affected by the conflict. This guy is awesome. Do I agree with all of his theology? I don't know. Do I agree with his tactics? Absolutely. Uh, he, would, he would be an elder here in a minute if he turned up. Right? The, the, the one exception, you just get an immediate stamp. You're the guy who deals with church discipline and critics online. Uh, so Sam Childers, was, he was a missionary and evangelist, but he primarily, his task was seeing children captive by Sudanese rebels and taken and turned into child soldiers. And he would go in, he would shoot the bad guys, he would liberate the children and take them back to orphanages and look after them. What do you think was the general reaction of the Christian sphere? Criticism and disavowment. Charity organizations on the ground shared criticisms about his unconventional methods. If it was conventional, no children would be soldiers. It's unconventional. His great uh, uh, feats of exploits are a judgment against those who are on the ground. Already. Anyway, they judged him for his unconventional methods, his insensitivity to the local culture. I don't care about your culture if it normalizes children being stolen. I don't think that is the normalization of the culture. I think that's the critics trying to justify their own inactivity. And his failure to address root causes. Sam, I know you've got an orphanage filled with these children who are no longer shooting at their brothers and sisters across a field with an AK-47 that they got given. I know they're not doing, I know they're coloring in and learning about Jesus and they're getting well fed. But did you ever stop to think that maybe your white guilt and supremacy and maybe your intersectionality and your your privilege has actually uh, uh, contributed towards the systemic racism that they're feeling that causes these things anyway? No. Bang! (laughs) He didn't deal with root causes because he thought and he acted. 
And so here's my uh, uh, word for you. Um, in a world that is dark and getting pretty dark in the season that we're in, there is plenty of room for ministry like Sam Childers. Maybe you feel called to be used by the Lord and you don't, want to be, you don't feel called to be a pastor. Pray about this, you know. If you're a dude, pray about this. This, you know, might just, it's on my heart for you and I want you to go home and think about it. Uh, but there will always, no matter what you do for the Lord, there will always be the, Ruben, the Rubens, the Gileads, the Dans, and the Ashes who sit back and criticize while doing nothing. Always. There'll always be these guys. Don't listen to them. For some people, obedience will be, your obedience will be far too tangible for the pietists. And so, like them, down in verse 23 of the song, the angel of the Lord curses Meroz because they lived nearby and they did not come and help the army. For being pacifists, God's angel cursed them. So here's the story. God answered his people's prayer. He rebuked the male failures. He honored the faithful women. He toppled the enemy kingdom and he restored Israel's peace. That's the story. How does this move forward? Redemptive history. This reminds us to not read Judges without Deuteronomy as our study guide. The book of Deuteronomy ends basically with the command of God through Moses to the new generation about to go into the land. If you break my covenant, I will curse you. I won't break my covenant with the nation as a whole. I will judge and I will sell into slavery under the Canaanites each individual or individual generation if you fail, if you don't obey my laws, if you worship idols, if you chase after false gods, God will curse you. If you obey God, if you keep his covenant, if you worship him truly and educate the coming generation, the law of Moses, then you'll be blessed and no enemy is too great for you. That was the dual warning that God gave to the Israelites and the book of Judges shows us that cycle after cycle, generation after generation of the Israelites failed, broke covenant and were judged. Moments of salvation, overarching judgment because of failure. And at some point you have to ask the question that Paul asks in Romans 5. If it was so easy to get wrong, if it was so easy to fail, and if it was so unable to actually make them righteous, why in the world did God bother with Israel and why did he bother giving them the law? That's a very good question. It's a question that the entire story of the Bible demands you ask because the answer is the gospel. The reason God gave the law to Moses for 1,500 years over the Israelites is so that there would be 1,500 years of irrefutable proof that humans, given every opportunity and the most perfect divine laws, can not please God. That is the, the law condemnation in the book of Judges. With everything handed to them on a silver platter, humans will still fail as long as there is anything resting on us to accomplish or obey to get to heaven by pleasing God. Cannot be done. 1,500 years of proof of that so that by the time Jesus comes, there's this, there's this empty plaque up on the wall. It's like if the Olympic Committee started a, a, created this, this uh, award, the first man to run the nine-second hundred meter. And you know who broke the 10-second? That's Usain Bolt. Imagine just in anticipation, they created an award, the first man to run the nine, and I, we'll get there probably with science and Genetics and whatever, maybe, maybe robotic people, who knows? We'll get there. A nine-second man on a hundred meter. And if they made that award and hung it over the athletics uh, games every Olympics, do you know what effect that would have on people? It would highlight that even the gold medalists are losers because they don't reach it. And it would remind that if you lost, you lost twice because you also didn't get the big one. You know what else it would do for me? It would make me watch the Olympics every year. Is this the year? I would watch every heat. I never watch heats. I just watch the finals. And that, I just watch the clips. I don't even have the patience for the nine seconds. <laughs> but I would watch every heat. Is this the guy? Is this the, the, the racer? Is this the athlete who's going to make it to the, to, the, to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the plaque? Is he going to be the first nine second man? 
And whenever we hit it, 2050, 2060, whenever we get there, will not every eye be turned upon the screen in anticipation waiting so that as he does it, we will say, the long awaited, the one we didn't know whether he would come, we waited so long, the final guy, he did it, the nine second hundred meter medalist, praise him, look at him, everyone will know his name. And that is what God did with the law. For 1,500 years and every day since Jesus as well, the law of God hung as this impossible standard with the reward of eternal life behind it. And every generation, every person, every king, every prophet, every judge, every leader in Israel, people watched and thought, is this the guy? Is he the Messiah? Is he going to keep the law? Is he going to save us all? Is he going to redeem us? No, everyone failed. You fail. I fail. Jesus fulfilled it. When he came, the ages long, millennia and a half long anticipation ticked over in God's timeline. He shone forth with righteous purity and perfection. And every eye who saw him, who knew him, and who now reads of him must say, there is one who can fulfill the law. His name is Jesus the Christ. That's why the law. That's why judges. That's why Deuteronomy. And then comes Jesus. A third question is, how does this point us to Jesus? Because Israel, Israel's failures point us to his perfection. Jesus was never judged by God. He was never judged by God. He was never under God's wrath until he was judged by God under God's wrath for our sins. He is the great fulfillment of another prophecy which was made in the context of male failure. When the first Barak, his name was Adam, failed in the garden and blamed his wife Eve, God cursed them but also promised the devil. He said, the woman will bring forth victory. There will be somebody born from the woman, a man, a seed, a child, an offspring, born from the woman, and he will crush the head of Satan, the great tempter and the great evil accuser, the great enemy of God's people, the Sisera Galore, the ultimate enemy of God, the great king of Canaan, he will be crushed under the feet of the one born from the woman. And Jesus comes forward and the prophecy that, 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 that Jesus uh, was to fulfill was that while he would crush the head of the devil, he would also be bruised in his heel. That is that in Jesus' salvation, the way that he wins salvation and crushes the head of the devil, he doesn't do it with a tent peg in the view of no one else in secret. He does it by having the, the nails driven through his own hand and thereby crushing Satan's skull behind him in the, the shame of a public crucifixion and death under the Romans. Jesus crushes the devil, the serpent's head, by his death on the cross in our place for our sins and in his rising. The song we sing says, Dying he reversed the curse from Adam and rising crushed the serpent's head. Jesus is the better Jael. He's way better than Barak. He kills Sisera's boss, the devil, and he brings salvation to all of God's people who trust in him. So, God, here's, our, here's where we find obedience. God hates cowards, and he inspired a song for Israel to sing and for us to read. Maybe we'll put this in our worship repertoire. Would that be fun? He, put, he inspired a worship song to be sung in churches about how cowards get cursed for not coming to the battle. In our day, whatever it is that the, God, that the Lord calls us to do, we must not be cowards. Do not be one. Do not be an expert theoretician criticizing while contributing nothing. Don't do that. Rather, we must build God's kingdom with the unlikely weapons he has given to us. A mallet and a tent peg in a homemaker's hands is how God toppled the kingdom in Judges. God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God uses the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are. God uses us, the weak things, doing weak things like praying, to topple the kingdoms of the world, to bring forth the kingdoms of God and his Christ. We pray, like Deborah did at the end, may all your enemies perish, O Lord. May your friends like the sun rising, in might. That's an imprecatory psalm. Do you know that word, imprecatory psalm? That means praying for the destruction and judgment of God's enemies. That's what that means. And evangelicals, Christians, New Testament Christians should pray the imprecatory psalms. Uh, as our final act of obedience and application, I'm going to read for us a, a, 
uh, imprecatory psalm or prayer against God's enemies. But basically, Deborah tells us to pray the same thing Jesus tells us to pray for. Lord, your kingdom come. Crush your enemies. Exalt the Lord Jesus. One of, the way, one of the tools, one of the things that are so shameful in the eyes of the world which we've been called to build God's kingdom with is a deep commitment and a faithful reliance on God in prayer. So here's our application. We'll read a, a psalm exalting God and asking him to kill his enemies. But also, if you are an enemy of God and you're currently outside of Jesus and have not trusted in his death and resurrection for you, you must do that now. We've seen in this story, he doesn't play games with eternal matters and his judgment is real. Sometimes the eternal judgment breaks out into this real world. So meet him in grace before he meets you in his judgment. Let's pray. Lord God, tear down your enemies. Please destroy and bring low every enemy. Crush the heads of Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and every other spirituality which enslaves souls and mock you with a high hand. Let the earth swallow up their places of pilgrimage and earthquake. May Mecca become a place where pigs graze and lay their dung. Slay those who abuse and oppress and enslave other humans and traffic children. Bury them without an epitaph and bury them without a gravestone. Snuff out their memory from mankind and destroy their empires. Shame them publicly who persecute your church. Ruin the reputation and name of those who take paychecks from churches, but who sit like cowards in their sofas and offices, polluting your fold with sinful lethargy. Establish in every nation, every state and town, churches of Jesus Christ that honor and worship you in his name. May kings and rulers submit to you and fill the world. Would you save your enemies by forgiving them in Jesus Christ? Pour out your grace like a flood, like the overflowing river Kidron, overwhelm your enemies with the mercy of Jesus Christ and bring them to the feet of Jesus. Destroy the chariots of self-righteousness that they trust in and send them running to the one who crushes the devil's skull and gives them peace, Jesus Christ. Exalt him as Lord and Savior over history in heaven and on earth, world without end. Amen and amen.